I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. I think Trump is so identified with the Trump part of his story that it's been a little bit of a revelation to Americans to find out that, oh, wait a minute, his mother was from Scotland. It's a great American story. It is the American story of poor immigrants arriving, working really hard, making America great, as the president says himself, uh, and establishing themselves in the new world. To go from there to where the Trump family ended up on the top of Trump Tower seems quite, quite the moonshot. When one of my friends said that one of her friends had pictures of a, a young Mary Trump, or Mary Ann McLeod as she was then, I first asked, well, what's her connection to the village? It turned out, none whatsoever. Her grandmother had been the teenage pen pal of Mary Ann McLeod, and they'd exchanged letters, of course, but they'd also swapped photos of each other, which gave us this incredible insight to, to the life of a young Mary Trump, Mary Ann McLeod, gave us a window into that world and gave us photos that not even the president himself might have seen. My dad voted for Trump, and we have our disagreements there. Um, so you know, we you know we, we, we went through that Christmas. So you know, we're over that now. You know, uh, we just don't talk about it. Um, but a lot of people I know in the states don't like him, of course, as well. So yeah. we could be here all day, kind of talking about this, right? Yeah, he's a horrible creep, and um... well, um, he's he's anti-immigrant, um, anti you know helping refugees. And I myself came to the United States as a refugee, so it's kind of personal for me. So if you're just like going on about immigrants, etc., that you know they're terrorists, they're uh, criminals, then of course they don't feel at home. Then they don't contribute if they can be. And we admire the work you do in trying to keep America safe and prosperous as we say in Scotland. Here's two back. You are a bastard, you pizza pig. You're a bastard.
telling you. I was like, it's amazing what you can do nowadays. Ach, um, Rami Roberts, but, but, um, well, some of you is from issue. That's the head and shear. Ach, have back on the here, Markham. Let me start to know the issue. Let's say, for sure. Hamishu as a nevade the maha dual throne. Yes. We were supposed to fly into New York on the Monday and I was gigging on the Wednesday night. Lo and behold, the flight was cancelled, so I didn't fly in until the Tuesday. And the Tuesday when we landed in New York, Donald Trump announced that he was running for presidency. Now, it takes about three to six weeks to write a good few gags. I had a 10 minute slot. In my infinite wisdom, I decided to change my material because, you know, it's a gift. You know, who can stand up on stage in New York and say, by the way, I'm from the same village as Donald Trump's mother? And um, so, lo and behold, I changed the, the set that night and luckily, fingers crossed, the little bit I did change worked. Could have been a disaster, but it wasn't. So I thought, so I sat at the castle. Is that the Rudovich? Ole, I thought this is royal. So, I'll open my gag and say, <clears throat> you know, from the same village as Donald Trump's mother, but I said, um, I'm sure there's nobody else in this room that can say they've eaten a piece of cake made by the cousin of the President of the United States of America on the night of their auntie's wake, and it gave them the shits. So, I always try to get the audience to talk that normally nobody can. <laughs> Although it was a poor family in a poor village uh, that she was born into, she had a slightly elevated status. Her dad was a councillor, he was a fisherman, so he was slightly wealthier than the crofters around him, and he ran the post office. He was the postmaster, uh, which would have been a kind of a trickle of an income as well. So they, although it was a family of ten, uh, they would have been slightly better off perhaps than, than other people. So although she was born in a black house, that stone thatched cottage that you see in these traditional photos of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, she grew up in what we call a White House, ironically enough, uh, which was the modern Department of Agriculture stone built, windowed, slate roofed house. Because her father was the, the postmaster as well, she had this other window on the world. Uh, telegrams would have come and gone, news would have been broken in the post office, letters would have come from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America from the colonies. So it was a kind of uh, a, a crossroads. Her house or her father's house would have been a crossroads on the world. Uh, she'd have had not just a village perspective, a, a kind of little parochial uh, perspective, basically the world came to her doorstep. So she was well prepared in, by all these kind of factors to go abroad herself, to, 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 to move to the States herself, which is what she did. village 
to this day you would describe as, as a Gaelic speaking village, I guess. It's, it's only three miles outside the main town of Stornoway in the Hebrides, which is an English speaking town. Uh, but the rural areas are Gaelic and certainly were Gaelic at the beginning of the 20th century. The, the, the language of, of the church, uh, the language of the home and the hearth would have been Gaelic, but the language of the school would have definitely been English. Uh, you know, Gaelic was not, uh, was not promoted or, or, or even condoned within the educational sphere. In fact, people are educated out of Gaelic to improve themselves, so, so they thought. Uh, and in fact, her father had a role in the school. Her father was almost, you would say, the school janitor. He was what they called the whipper in, which was a kind of a stipend somebody got to go out and collect the kids who were truanting. For example, if they were truanting, digging potatoes in the autumn, or if they were truanting, cutting peat or turf uh, at the beginning of the summer, his job would have been to whip them in, get them into school. So. Yeah, she'd have lived in a Gaelic-speaking world and had a window on the world through, through letters and news coming into the post office and obviously an English perspective on the world through, through her education. The arrival of medical care in the islands, I think, is a tremendous boon. Well, it was in so many ways, but in other ways it wasn't. Because the old, say, early Victorian times, you may be ten children, you raise four with luck. And suddenly you're having ten children raising ten. And the question immediately came, how are you going to feed them? And when they grow up, where are they going to live? Well, as the Croft is small enough, you could perhaps share it with one son. But with ten of a family, most of them are going to have to leave. All her brothers and sisters emigrated. Uh, there was a huge wave of emigration from the islands and from across Europe after the First World War. The island of Lewis had suffered particularly harshly in the First World War. There was a great loss of men. There was a great uh, tragic loss of men at the end of the war, compounded with huge demand for land. It was an overpopulated uh, island. No work and literally no food. I was saying to somebody recently, it sounds terrible put so baldly, but there was a shortage of eligible men. So many had been lost in the war, so many had gone off on the Marlock and the Metagam with these ships, that for a young woman, the chances were, stay at home if you want, find a job in Stornway if you can, or leave. And most of them left. There was nothing else they could do. Between 1922 and 1924, 150 people left that village. Now, they would have all walked out past Mary Ann's front door. She would have seen that migration generation, as I call them, leave. And that was a, wasn't a unique experience to Lewis or, or Scotland. It, you know, Italians, Irish, Germans, all left Europe to go to the New World at that time. Thank you.
Marianne was 14 years old, uh, she must have seen in a newspaper uh, this competition winner in, in the Dundee Courier. Uh, this other young girl, who was 15, Agnes Steven, had won an art prize in the Dundee Courier. Uh, and Agnes recalls in later life how she received a letter from a young Marianne MacLeod uh, writing to her from the lonely Isle of Lewis, as she put it. Uh, all her brothers and sisters had gone abroad to, to Canada and New Zealand and, uh, and the States and she wondered if she could be a pen pal. And they began corresponding. Uh, they began writing to each other and that was a correspondence and a, a deep friendship that, that lasted their whole, whole life long. was uh, my grandmother and she was born in Carnoustie in Scotland uh, and then she grew up in Dundee uh, in a tenement. Um, she was an only child. She learnt the piano at a very early age and they had a piano in the, in the, the flat um, and she entered lots of different uh, festivals and competitions. Uh, and won quite a lot of them. Um, her father would um, take her sort of into a Broth or um, Edinburgh sometimes um, and over to Glasgow for um, various festivals um, and she would often win medals. Um, but she was also academically uh, very bright. Um, so I think her parents persuaded her to move towards the, the academic rather than the musical. My first year at Dundee High was not really a happy one, in contrast to my early school years. I was one of five scholarship pupils, none from my part of Dundee. Most of my classmates belonged to wealthy families and had also attended the junior part of the school with high fees before coming to class five where I started. My mother had sewn my school uniform at home, even my coat, and I think I felt myself to be a sort of second class pupil which seems silly nowadays, but there was certainly a lot of snobbery at Dundee High. The very first one that she sent, in fact, with the first letter is um, of Marianne. Um, she appears to be on a, um, a cliff top uh, with a, a friend or, or one of her sisters um, picking wildflowers. Um, it's a lovely photograph. Agnes and Mary developed this pen pal relationship for a couple of years and so when Mary Ann left Lewis for the first time 
to head to New York, where her, two of her elder sisters already were, she stopped off in Glasgow and Agnes and she met up for the first time. And as Agnes recalls in, in her memoir, which, which, which we've, we've read and read, it seems to be a kind of an instant kind of attraction. You can tell that two young girls who just kind of loved being with each other. They just seemed to have so much fun together and, and, and were very, very close. The, you know, they were both um, in, from modest backgrounds, um, both ambitious to, to get away from that. Um, I think my grandmother, um, sort of academically, she wanted to get away from um, Dundee and the tenements. And obviously Mary... Um, she wanted, you know, she had ambitions to to follow her brothers and sisters. the well-known immigration station at Ellis Island, New York. During the busy period of a few years ago, more prospective citizens of this country arriving from abroad entered through this world-renowned station than through any other port of the country. The story of the village, of course, is that Mary Ann MacLeod went to New York on holiday to see her sister. Now, very few people went on holiday from the Isle of Lewis in the 1920s. And Agnes Stiven re reveals in her own memoir of her correspondence with Mary Ann that she actually went to work as a domestic. Uh, her sister was working as a, a domestic servant in a house in New York. Mary Ann MacLeod, she may well have gone on holiday to New York, but was quickly found work as a domestic servant in upstate New York. First of the family I know of was a, a cousin of hers who went across uh, to the Canada first, probably in the United States, and married there. Then, like most people, they were doing all right, she'd go home to visit. And when she went back, she took Mary Ann's sister with her. Mary Ann's sister married there. She came back with a child to visit, and she took Mary Ann back with her. And gradually the whole family moved across stage by stage as they went. of a, a large number of people employed as domestics in the U.S. at that time. That was a very significant part of the workforce. I've seen it reported, and I have to, I'm not quite sure if it's something like a third, a very significant portion, because this was an industrialized country, but that was just nothing like it would be even a decade later. Everything got ramped up in World War II and then really took off. gave her a glimpse at just how the rich live 
and a sort of grand dame uh, appearance and presentation of Carnegie's widow. And certainly, in her later years, Mary Trump had a kind of a grand dame look with her mink coat and her very um, elegant and ladylike presentation. It's a little early to call him a magnet, but he's, he was a, a real estate developer. His father had been at the very, had established the family in Queens after having come to the U.S. from Germany, gotten together the kind of first nest egg by being a hotel manager and owner in the Northwest and the Yukon during the gold rush. That grub stake comes back to New York City and is the beginning of the Trumps in real estate. He and his mother were sort of real estate travelers, I guess you could say. They, he would build a house, they would live in it, they would sell it, they'd move, then he'd build another house, they'd move to that house. So they changed addresses a number of times as he would build these spec houses and then sell them as he was getting going in the course of the 1920s in Queens. a very, very sharp-eyed, on-the-make guy who realized bankruptcy court, foreclosed properties, that would be a really good place to be looking for areas that he could develop. And he had just gotten going in that when he meets Mary McLeod. My grandmother um, got a scholarship, um, a Carnegie scholarship, um, to go and study um, somewhere in Europe. She was given the option of various uh, universities, uh, and she chose Marburg University um, in Germany um, and went there in 1933, which obviously was a very uh, significant year.
when she goes back out in 1934, she meets Agnes Stiven again. They meet up in Glasgow. Uh, when you read Agnes's uh, memoir, they had a wild time. They went shopping on Sohail Street, on the big main street. Uh, Marianne buys fur-lined gauntlets for her boyfriend. Uh, and Agnes says, will he like them? And Marianne says, he better. You know, so she's quite, you know, she's quite firm about it. They went to see the Queen Mary, uh, the great passenger liner that was being constructed on the Clyde in the Clyde shipyards at the time. And then she sails off. Marianne sails off in the SS Transylvania to New York for the last time as a MacLeod. The legend is that they met at a party, it's certainly plausible, and she would describe him as the most eligible bachelor in New York. I think that was absolutely how she saw him. I'm not sure that this was an official title, but he was eligible, he was a bachelor, and he was a handsome guy. He supposedly went home and said to his mother, I've met the woman I'm going to marry. These kinds of sentiments are lovely to hear, and whether they happened on that night, we don't know. There's a photo of her in uh, upstate New York, uh, in the Hamptons, uh, and she's sitting by a swimming pool. Once again, it's a black and white photo, but you know that hair is platinum blonde. She looks like Hollywood. She's wearing a bathing costume. Uh, she just looks incredibly glamorous. She is, she's completely transformed. Uh, and a final photo of her in the driveway of the new home her husband had built for her in Queens, in the up-and-coming borough of Queens in New York, and she's sitting on that driveway holding her first-born child, also called Marianne, uh, and she's made it, hasn't she? She's just gone from the old world, where she was born into dirt poor family of ten, and she, here she is in the richest country in the world, in the richest city in the world, married to one of the men who's going to become the richest men in the world. My grandmother um, married a fellow student um, who was German, obviously, and um, you know she was a German uh, living in Germany when war broke out. So um, you know her home country was at war with her husband's, 
uh, country. It must have been a very difficult um, predicament. The war changed everything. Uh, Agnes was a, a German student, a very talented university student. She studied in Germany. She had a German fiancé. Uh, and in that window of hope, they must have thought hope, when Chamberlain and Hitler made peace in 1938, they got married and she moved to Germany. Marianne, of course, was on the other side of the Atlantic in America, married to uh, a second generation German, as it happened. They both married German men, but their fate was very different. Marianne's life became one of opulence and wealth in, in, in the borough of Queens in, in New York. Uh, Agnes's life uh, turned out very differently. Men of the gallant British First and Eighth Armies are welcomed with open arms. In these pictures of Prague's liberation just released, German signs are torn down and smashed. But Prague's long fight is not yet won. It was the Americans who um, sort of drove in um, and started um, sort of liberating the different towns. And my grandmother, being very pragmatic, leapt out of the cellar as the American troops arrived and uh, yelling that she was Scottish, um, so it was sort of taming her home nationality again. Um, and offered her services uh, as a translator. an epic journey across Europe uh, with hundreds of other, perhaps thousands of other um, refugees um, all returning home. Um, and she returned um, first uh, you know, across the channel to London and then took the train home to Dundee. And um, she um, writes about how um, you know, the White Cliffs of Dover were very poignant, but nothing compared to um, crossing the Tay. Uh, that, was, that was real homecoming. Friday was a wearisome day. We were too tired to want to look at London. We had something to eat again before boarding the night express to Edinburgh at 7pm. We had a carriage for ourselves and the children stretched out on the seats, but none of us slept much. Edinburgh was at the end of the line. It was just after dawn and bitterly cold. The first train to Dundee was at 7am. We spent two hours in a deserted, bleak waiting room on Waverley Station and finished off our last biscuits, bought with US dollars on the ferry. It was about 9am when the train rumbled over the Tay Bridge. The children were awestruck by the huge bridge and the glittering expanse of the river. The city and the imposing bulk of the law came into sight. I hugged the children and burst into tears. This was home at last.
his father was famous for a deal is closing, everybody's got their pens out, and his father insists on renegotiating. A guy very, very frugal, a very hard bargainer, and very hard on his children, in, at least within the workplace. And the older brother seems didn't, was not able to stand up to that and was sort of shunted aside. And Donald, very early on, became the most uh, aggressive one and became the heir apparent. And, and that seemed, by the time he left high school, that that was pretty well established. Who would enter West Point from civilian life, normally seek an appointment from their congressmen or senators. Other appointments go to enlisted men of the regular armed forces, the National Guard, and the reserves. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. In later life, we know for sure, she'd come home. She'd come home to see her cousins, she'd come home to the old country, often accompanied by, a, by her elder daughter, Marianne. She certainly didn't dress down in older age. She seemed to like her, her furs and her kind of fancy hair, you know, as she was kind of very, very, very groomed uh, lady. And she'd have been seen around town, uh, you know, looking dressed as she was walking down the sidewalks of Manhattan, but actually walking down the pavements of a harbour town of Stornoway. So I guess she would have stood out uh, and she was known, but she came and went and uh, her family, you know, had kept maintained the family connections uh, right up to the, to the time of her death. You would be able to tell that Miriam Trump left the country. To tell you the honest truth, well, how she was to us anyway. I remember my mother and father came up one day and they had asked her up for dinner one night. Miriam and Dana, Miriam's sister and the husband. And you would never say listening to the three of them that mary Ann and her sister had ever lived. They didn't have, I almost said accident, 
They didn't even have, have an accent. accent America, yeah. I don't know what they might have been like when they were over the yard. That could have been different. But certainly when they would come home, they didn't have any accent. No. They were lovely. They were beautiful. That's the honest truth. At that time, the Trump name wasn't so famous anyway, although many in the village did know that she had married a very wealthy man. But after that, there was no mention of Donald at the time. And with that, people didn't have much reason to take interest in the family. People would know a little about him, not much. They were left alone here. None of them and none of the sisters either. They never turned, never looked down on the people of Tongue Village ever. And that's as honest as I can be. No. They were pleased at how she did, after she left the island and the circumstances of poverty. They were very proud that she had done well, and that she had enough of worldly things anyway, and that she kept up the relationship she had with this place, with her home. With that, she taught the family in the ways of the island, in the ways of the community, and I would hear that about them. I'm sure they are proud. I wouldn't say they weren't. I'm proud. I'm not sure if that is because they're related to me or not. I don't know. But certainly they were a lovely couple. and her mother. They gave a lot of money to Tung for the hall. They gave a lot of money to Bethesda. Donald never gave a penny, no. You know about that? Everybody knows Selena's guy. <laughs> the most eligible bachelor in New York. So there. The next morning, she wrote a letter to the 66th floor, Trump Towers, addressed to, to Mary Trump, enclosing photocopies of the photos she had received 60 years earlier to prove that she wasn't just, uh, just, just somebody trying to con her. She sent off this letter, and that very weekend, she got a reply back from Mary Trump, explaining how she'd been looking for her childhood friend all these years and had lost her. And they were reunited.
Marianne and her daughter were um, visiting London and uh, she telephoned my grandmother and said, come and have lunch with us at the Dorchester. And so, of course, my grand, um, you know, always one for a bit of glamour, um, said absolutely and rushed down to London on the train um, and uh, entered the Dorchester and they had their, their poignant reunion. Um, I think one of the nicest things about it was that uh, my grandmother said she still sounded exactly the same. She still had the same uh, lovely accent. Uh, and my grandmother obviously still sounded like she was from Dundee. Um, you know, they were still the best of friends. And it was just like they were teenagers again. And they kept in touch um, after that as well. I think uh, Mary Ann sort of would send photographs of her family. Um, she sent videos of um, anniversaries and birthdays and lots of glamorous parties in New York and, um, and in Florida. To go from there to where the Trump family ended up on the top of Trump Tower seems quite, quite the moonshot um, and literally unimaginable. It's a great American story. It is the American story of pure immigrants arriving, working really hard, making America great, as the president says himself.